Well, hey, all of you sheepies, near and far. Today is the 22nd of December. Therefore, we are in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. Kind of a lot of reading, and we are heading to the cross here, so things are amping up. The headers in your Bible might read, The Plot to Kill Jesus. It reads that way in all four Gospels at some point. Uh, a couple years ago, I did a Lenten service looking at each of the Gospels' take on the plot to kill Jesus. That's, I think, what, how our chapter 22 begins. We remember that meals are important in Luke's Gospel. We have, have had several table conversations. Table conversations. And, and now we are leading into the Passover. Passover and Festival of Unleavened Bread used to be two separate Jewish festivals, and then the Jews, Jews merged them into one. And our story begins here. Celebration of the pet. The Passover was, was near. Celebration, it's a celebration of the Exodus. The Passover lamb, we remember uh, the Exodus, God's deliverance. For the people of Israel. They were to share a Passover lamb and then smear that blood on their doorframe and then God would pass over their home and, and spare them. Exodus chapter 12. If you've got some time tonight as it's storming outside or tomorrow, read Exodus chapter 12. That is the story of the Passover. So who is about to be the new Passover lamb? Christ, right? The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to kill Jesus. They don't mince words here. The plot to kill Jesus. There is no sugar coating. The chief priests and scribes were looking for a way to kill Jesus, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Satan, it tells us Satan entered Judas Iscariot. And he went to cut a deal with the chief priests. And they were greatly pleased, it says. So how, do, how does this make you feel? Both with the, the chief priests. These are the church guys. We're looking for a way to kill Jesus. And then it tells us Satan entered Judas Iscariot. And he was looking for an opportunity. And then he went to the chief priests who were greatly pleased. So how did Satan enter Judas? Well, the same way Satan plays with us. Jealousy, envy, greed, pride, arrogance, want to be, the want, the urge, to the feeling to be number one. We've been watching the series, the TV series, The Chosen. If you have, again, if you have not checked out The Chosen, I urge you to do that. This is how I, I imagine Jesus to be. And at the end of season two, season two has just been completed. And now season three, episodes one and two have been in theaters and they've been broadcasting um, episodes on the chosen app but at the end of season two we are finally introduced to Judas and he's portrayed as uh, someone who doesn't have any parents I don't know if that's biblical biblically accurate or not I guess I haven't done that much research on that I'm sure the chosen has or maybe it's for dramatic effect I don't know but we see in episode one and two of The Chosen, that Judas just has a sister. He, he, he's an orphan, you know. He, he doesn't have a mom or dad or parents. He just has a sister, and he goes off to follow Jesus. But we can, can kind of already see his personality, his need to be great, you know, his want. So how does Satan enter Judas? By the, these attributes of jealousy and envy and, and greed. 
the same way Satan plays with us. And if you say Satan doesn't play with you, well, excuse me, there's a little bit of apple juice running down your chin there, you know, like the garden when Eve bit the apple. She had the same, that's how Satan entered into the garden too, by jealousy and need and and, and want and, and greed. Sometimes we make Judas out to be the bad guy, but we can have these same attributes. And if we keep, take our eyes off Jesus, we're going to get sucked in. We'll, we'll get sucked in to sin. So they agreed to give him money, the chief priests. We know that Judas was the money guy. He was the treasurer. And Judas began to look for an opportunity. This was calculated. This was calculated. The rule of wealth is always contrary to the rule of God. Preparing for the Passover, the ultimate table conversation. The Passover lamb needed to be sacrificed <laughs> in more ways than one here. During Passover, Jerusalem would swell to to about 500,000 people. Wowza. Now, we need to remember, there was only one church. Again, I keep emphasizing this, one church. And the Passover was the festival, a festival of religious festivals. So every good Jew made sure to get to Passover. You know, maybe they weren't able to get to the festival of shelters. That was another festival. Uh, or other festivals. But the Passover was the one. They made sure they got to that. And so we see that Peter and John were in charge of making arrangements. Jesus says, follow the guy with a water jar and he will show you where to go. The upper room. Passover was to be celebrated with one's family. Jesus redefines family here. The family of God. We mentioned that before a little bit. It's important to note that Jesus is not clueless in all of this. He knows exactly what is about to go down and he is fully involved in preparing for his own death. Funeral arrangements. Do you have your funeral arrangements planned? As a pastor, I like to remind people that it's good to jot some notes. What hymns do you want? What scripture do you want? Who do you want to be the pastor at, uh, at your, your funeral? What kind of things do, do you want? Because if you don't write them down, your kids are going to do whatever. So funeral arrangements. The Lord's Supper. We, we know this as the Lord's Supper. Exodus chapter 12. Go back and read um, the Passover. This is about covenant making and reflecting on God's deliverance. It's about remembering. The Passover is all about remembering and telling God's story of how God has delivered the Israelites. How God has delivered us as well. Tell the story of faith. Again, I'm going to you know, keep urging you to write down some of the stories of your faith journal. Buy a spiral notebook or a composition book or a pretty journal. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just write down some stories, uh, stories of your faith, how God has brought you from place to place. Your kids will enjoy that later on. Today's, you know, even after Christmas here, I know it's kind of busy, but the hustle and bustle with all of this snow and wind and blowing and you're cooped up, that's something that you could do. Write down things. Write down memories. This is still God's deliverance. Jesus is ushering in a new covenant. This is a new covenant. He even says that this is a new covenant. This one, this covenant is about kingdom and service and servanthood. And he calls upon his disciples to be a full embodiment of what all of that means. Only in Luke do we see two cups at the table. Two cups before the meal, two cups after the meal. There's a Passover ritual. Sharing a table signifies friendship and hospitality. And so as we think about that, who is at the table? Well, the disciples, but including who? 
Judas is at the table. Judas is at the table. Friendship table. He's at the table of friendship. All of the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. All that in a bag of chips. We know from John's gospel that they were so arrogant that, you know, it was customary for the lowest person in the household to wash, wash feet upon entering the room. Well, maybe they didn't make arrangements for that at, during the upper room. And the disciples certainly weren't going to wash feet. Nobody washed feet. And so we know from John's gospel, which is the only gospel account, that we get the foot washing. Jesus takes it upon himself, this role of a servant to wash feet. But the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest, who's all that in a bag of chips. And Jesus finally says, knock it off, not here. Kings of this world will lord it over their people, but not you, not you guys. You have to be different then, different then, you know? The greatest among you will be a servant. Different than the kingdom of God is always countercultural. Even today, the kingdom of God is always countercultural. Culture is going to tell you bigger, better, more money. Number one, the king, that's not the way of the kingdom. Those things are not bad things. It's not bad to have money. How do you use what God has given you? How do you, how do we use what God has given us. The lowly will be exalted, and those that think they are great are going to be humbled. Still today, that's the way it's going to be. Someday, Jesus says, someday you will sit on the thrones with me and judge the 12 tribes of Israel, but not yet, friends. There's work to do. There's work to do. This conversation with Peter. Jesus has a little talk with Peter. Interestingly, Jesus calls him Simon here, his given name. Simon, Simon, Satan has already demanded to sift you like wheat, but I'm praying for you, Simon. I'm praying over you. Jesus says, once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Let's not forget this. Once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. What does this say? Well, it tells us, well, we know that Peter's going to deny Jesus three times, right? And Peter doesn't argue here. There's, a, there's conversation in the other Gospels between Peter and Jesus. Never, Lord, never will I leave you, That this kind of thing. We just get a snippet there um, in Luke. But in the other conversations, we get more. But this tells us that Jesus is not going to give up on Peter. And if Jesus doesn't give up on Peter, the rock, who denies him three times, friends, Jesus is never going to give up on us. Even when we have had a really crapola day, and, you know, I always say you just as well tell Jesus what you're thinking because Jesus knows anyway. You know, if you're angry, if you're hurt, well, whatever, give it to the Lord because Jesus already knows. He doesn't give up on Peter, and he doesn't give up on us. Once you have turned back, I'm going to need you, Peter. I'm going to need you. Once you, it's not going to be forever that you have denied me. Might feel like it, but it's not. Once you've come around, and when you do, I still need you to be the rock. I still need you to, to lead the pack. I still need you to be the leader of the church. We see Peter restored in John's Gospel, chapter 21. That's just the, the beautiful beach conversation. You know, three times. Three, three times Jesus restores Peter, just like three times Jesus, d Peter denied Jesus. I'm trying to get my notes here, sorry. A purse, a bag, and a sword. Before Jesus sent them out with nothing. Remember, don't take anything with you. But Jesus, I want my cell phone and my, my pillow and my blanket and my toothbrush and maybe some music. But now, he's, what's up with this? Take, take a purse, a bag, and a sword. What's up? Well, Jesus is telling us that there is a shift coming, friends. 
before they were casting out demons and healing and hanging out with Jesus and people were receiving them well. There was hospitality because they were hanging out with Jesus. But things are about to change here. And their mission after this is going to be met with hostility. And so we go from hospitality to hostility. A sword. They will just means they're going to be met with violence. But Jesus says you're not to retaliate here. They say, <laughs> they say, it doesn't say who said it. But to me, it sure sounds like Peter. Someone says, look, Lord, we've got two swords. Is that enough? <laughs> and we're ready to roll. And Jesus says, enough, enough. I can just see Jesus exasperated. Enough of this. And then they go to the olive grove, the garden, the Mount of Olives. I, I love how I think other gospel accounts call it the olive grove. To me, that I, I like how that reads, the sound of that, the olive grove. They went out to the olive grove, and um, another one of our gospels tells us that they sang a hymn on the way out to the olive grove. They got to the olive grove, and Jesus prays. And he says to the disciples, you have to pray for strength. You, you have to stay awake, friends, and pray. Jesus is the example here. He's the example when some hard stuff is going down, what do we need to do? We need to pray. Well, we find out they fall asleep. You know, they had that meal and that wine, and boy, it's been a day. And they fall asleep. Jesus is talking. We, we get a whole bunch of red letter Jesus words. If you have a red letter Bible, um, I would, you know, get a red letter Bible and get one with, um, you know, the, the commentary and the, the cross reference that I, I can urge you to get one. If you want to buy yourself a present, that's a good present to, to have. Here in Luke, we see an angel, which I love. Angel appears here in Luke, and we see Jesus sweating drops of blood only in Luke again. Luke is a physician, so Luke likes the details. Now, I went back and looked it up because I knew there was a fancy medical term here, and I can't read my notes. Um, hematoidrosis. Hemat I'm probably saying that wrong. Hematoma, der well, hematoma, that's a bruise. I got nurse friends. Ruth Granatz, you can help me out. Hematodrosis, I think. It, it's rare, but it is a real condition. Um, I think Leonardo da Vinci has, has written that sometimes before battle, soldiers would get this condition. Um, the capillaries in your, your blood vessels burst and you can literally sweat drops of blood very rare but it happens but only in Luke we see this betrayal and arrest now I call this stepping forward years ago and it's probably been almost 20 years ago now when I was state youth coordinator I wrote a devotion about this I looked at all four gospel accounts at the arrest of Jesus only in John's gospel do we see Jesus stepping forward First, to meet Judas and the army of men, the, the soldiers. But the other three Gospels, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and here in Luke, we see that Judas steps forward and kisses Jesus, stepping forward. It's in all four Gospels, but only in John do we see Jesus stepping forward first to receive the kiss from Judas. The other three, Judas steps forward first. And what does, a crowd came, it says, with Judas leading. Jesus says to Judas, Judas, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? <laughs> really? The Son of Man, there's our phrase again. We find out in the other Gospels that it is Peter that chops off the right ear of one of the temple guards. One of the Gospels names him, I think, Melchius. 
Jesus says, knock it off, Peter, put the sword away. And then <sighs> Jesus magically super glues that ear back on. I, I love that part. <sighs> We, we see the ear healed. Can you imagine that soldier and the ones who see it? Wow. Put the sword away, Peter. And then Jesus says to the temple guards, you're treating me like some kind of bandit? You could have arrested me in broad daylight any day, teaching in the temple, but instead here you are, treating me like a bandit. Peter denies Jesus. Now, there's going to be this ping-pong match of trials. We get three trials. Here we get two. Number one, it takes place at the home of the high priest Caiaphas. Caiaphas was not a nice guy. Peter follows at a distance, we see, and John goes, goes in. I don't think it tells us here that here in Luke, but... One of the other Gospels tells us that Peter's following at a distance, but John goes in. Um, John's got a little more clout with the religious leaders, and so John goes in. But Peter, Peter's hanging out in the courtyard, isn't he? Around the fire pit. When all of a sudden, a servant girl calls to him and says, Hey, haven't you been hanging out with Jesus? Aren't you one of his followers? Nope, not me, Peter says. Denial number one. A little bit later, we hear somebody say, I'm pretty sure that I've seen you with Jesus. Peter says the second time, mm -mm, not me. Then later on, someone else says to Peter, you are one of Jesus's disciples. And Jesus says, nope. And just then, we see Jesus meet Peter's gaze. And just like that, what happens? cockle doo doo the rooster crows. And Peter remembers, and it tells us he ran away and wept bitterly. Can you imagine Peter? Mocking and beating. Just a little while ago, I asked you to repeat after me that he will be arrested and spit on and mocked and scorned and beat with a whip and persecuted. Well, here we are, friends. Here we are. They're holding Jesus, and they do all of these things that he predicted that they would do. Now, we, we find out now, though, too, that he's blindfolded. They blindfold him. These are the religious leaders, the church guys, friends. They blindfold him, and they strike him, and they say, prophesy, who hit you? You know, if you are the Son of God, if you are really the Messiah, then you should know who hit you? Wow. Wow. Trial number two. He's taken before a church council of sort. It's a scene change. More religious leaders. And they ask him, are you the son of God? And Jesus replies, you say that I am. Well, that's all they needed to hear. That's all the proof they needed. And they hand him off to Pontius Pilate which opens chapter 23. We are almost there, friends. We are almost there. So how are you feeling about all of this? Here we are two days before Christmas Eve, three days before the birth of Christ, a new in our hearts. And we've traveled all the way from the birth, that all from the story of Luke 1 and 2 that we will hear read Christmas Eve in our churches, all the way to the cross, almost. So how you feeling? How you feeling? Kind of heavy. Well, I'm still working on worship. I, <laughs> I'm getting closer, but man, um, you know, it's just been a hard year to um, missing my mom. Um, I, like you, am disliking this weather. I'm sure you are. Maybe some of your family has had to change travel plans. Um, you know, I, I stepped outside briefly. I saw the birds were looking for a little something to eat, and all I had was bread. I'm, I know that's not the best for them, 
and some blueberries. But at least it was a little something something. And uh, immediately when I threw it out after I came back in, was watching out the window, they devoured it. Uh, poor little birds. So if you have some bird seed, um, see if you can't throw some out for the birds. But I tell you what, I wasn't even out five minutes and it is so cold. I don't think I've ever experienced cold like this. And the furnace is running and running and running. So I just pray over everyone's homes. In fact, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to be together and to travel through Luke's gospel. We remember your sacrifice. Of course, as we step into Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we celebrate and we sing and we remember how God uh, stepped down into our world through you as a baby. You know, Mary and Joseph and, and all of the things as we sing Silent Night. and But help us also to remember the sacrifice. We pray over everyone's homes that the furnace stays going. We pray for those that are working that absolutely have to get to work to care for people, to care for people, medical staff. And we know that some plows have been pulled off the road. And so we just pray for all of those that take care of us. Lord, help us to take care of each other too. Give us good rest tonight and uh, keep us safe tomorrow and in the days to come. In your name we pray, amen. All right, friends, have a good night. I'm gonna try to post this a little bit early tonight. Bye for now. We'll see you tomorrow.